Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, this unit is on language, and I want to start by defining language. Before I do that though, I want to start by commenting on the trajectory of some of the different topics we've been discussing. Uh, the first few lectures have been all about mental representations, similarity, memories, uh, short-term memory, long-term memory, concepts, and knowledge. But remember, thinking is more than just forming and storing mental representations. It's about how you use those mental representations. So this is kind of the first class where we'll start to transition away from the basics of cognitive architecture and cognitive psychology, and we'll start talking about how we use and manipulate mental, represent, mental representations uh, to affect behavior. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about uh, language and thinking. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that it's really hard to even well, it's kind of hard to even think about thinking without using language. So can you think of anything without uh, having some linguistic component to it? As soon as you try to remember something, you start to uh, have an inner dialogue. Uh, as soon as you uh, think about planning something, we often talk to ourselves when we do that. So it's really difficult to imagine how we think outside of using language. I mean, clearly, we access behaviors and we uh, learn things without using language. But in terms of inspecting our own thoughts uh, and planning, we tend to use language to do that. So let's talk about what language is uh, and what language isn't. And I want to start with an example of non-human uh, communication. So language in humans is used to communicate. It's also used to uh, do a lot of other things. Uh, so we can uh, have conversations with people. Uh, we can direct people's actions. Uh, we can direct our own actions. Uh, other, other species do this as well, uh, but they don't do it in exactly the same way. So I want to talk about two examples uh, from different species and how they use uh, their behaviors uh, to communicate with other uh, members of their species. Uh, then we're going to sort of contrast that with what humans do and maybe draw a distinction between human and non-human uh, communication. So with bees, you probably know this example. Uh, it's pretty familiar to a lot of people. Uh, bees, honeybees, engage in some behaviors to communicate to other bees where there might be a source of food. Because remember, for a lot of honeybees, the worker bees, their whole job is to fly around, uh, find nectar, bring it back to their hive so that they can make honey, which they then use to feed uh, the eggs that turn into other bees, right? So that's, that's what bees do. Um, so if a bee finds a source of food, uh, they can come back to the hive uh, and engage in what's called a waggle dance. Uh, and you can look this up on YouTube, uh, but it works uh, something like what's shown uh, on this slide. So the bee goes out, finds honey, comes back to the honeycomb, uh, and then engages in this dance where it kind of waggles back and forth uh, and then does a figure eight. Uh, it does a waggle, does another waggle, and a figure eight. And you can sort of see here in the, uh, 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 in the directory. It moves, waggles forward, turns to the right, waggles, turns to the left, and then it keeps doing this dance. Uh, and there are two pieces of information it can communicate to the other bees who are watching it. One is the angle. So if it's straight up, uh, from where the other bees are watching, uh, straight up vertical inside the hive, uh, that tells the other bees that the food is in the direction of the sun. Uh, if they waggle in a way that's not straight up, uh, so maybe a 30 degree angle to the left from the vertical inside the hive, that tells them to fly 30 degrees to the left of the sun. And if it's 30 degrees to the right, uh, sort of clockwise to the right, uh, then the bees have to fly 30 degrees to the right of the sun. So the angle that they do the straight line part of their dance on, tells the other bees uh, where to, uh, which direction to fly. The time that they spend waggling before they turn tells them how far. Uh, so as they waggle, uh, that gives the other bees some information about how long they need to keep flying. Uh, so it's time dependent. So with this simple dance, they can communicate two pieces of information to uh, other bees. Now, bees have a a brain system and a neural system that's about the size of a pinhead. It's not a very big brain. Uh, so they're not really thinking about, uh, you know, having a conversation with the other bees. They're not uh, having a discourse. Uh, they're doing something that they have no choice uh, to do, right? This is an instinct. Uh, they find the food, they come back, and they do this behavior. 
uh, the other bees see it and they can then uh, fly in the same direction. Uh, it works for the bees. It's not the only thing that bees use to navigate. Obviously, they use other senses, but this is one way in which they can communicate the source of foods to other bees in the colony. Uh, the question I want you to think about for the next few slides is, does this really count as language use, or is this a very limited kind of communication? Another kind of uh, non-human uh, type of communication is seen in great apes. So uh, different kinds of primates, which we're very closely related to as humans, uh, can communicate with each other in much more sophisticated ways than maybe the bees do. Now, maybe that's a bit of a, a stretch. Bee communication is pretty sophisticated. Uh, it's just limited uh, to what bees need to do. Uh, for non-human primates, uh, these can be monkeys, uh, great apes, uh, the communication can be a little bit more sophisticated, or at least closer to what humans consider to be language. Now, among all different kinds of primates, there's a lot of, there's a big range of communication. Uh, but bonobo chimpanzees, which are a type of great ape, uh, seem to have the most sophisticated human-like language. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, they have a large uh, cerebral cortex. Uh, two, they tend to be less aggressive than some of the other uh, than chimpanzees do, uh, and they tend to be able to pick up these kinds of cues. So one that's really famous uh, is a bonobo chimpanzee named Kanzi. Kanzi lives in Georgia uh, and has learned to communicate with his trainers uh, via a lexigram system. So what I've shown here on the right, on the left is a picture of Kanzi, uh, on the right is a picture of part of Kanzi's lexigram, and these are symbols that Kanzi can put together to form sentences. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, with Kanzi to show how uh, not only Kanzi can learn to communicate with uh, his trainers, uh, but also how Kanzi can communicate with other chimpanzees uh, and other bonobos. Uh, so before you continue, well, you can do this in either order, but uh, I am going to post the link for this video. It's about a 10-minute video that shows an interview with Kanzi and Kanzi's trainers. Uh, and it shows how they can acquire different types of uh, almost human-like language. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of stills from the video uh, because I want to point a few things out. Uh, and then we'll move on to talking about how non-human communication isn't quite the same as human language. So you can watch the video now and then come back to this one, uh, or you can complete this video uh, and then uh, watch the short video about Kanzi. So you're going to see a couple of things in this, or if you've watched it already, you've seen a couple of things in this. Uh, one of them is uh, a lot of interactive discourse between Kanzi and the trainer. So here's a picture of Kanzi helping uh, his trainer and psychologist Sue Savage Rumbaugh uh, cooking in the kitchen. Now, Clearly, this is probably not the kind of, um, you know, standard restaurant hygiene practices. You probably wouldn't want to eat the food that Kanzi has been cooking. It's clear that Kanzi is not washing his hands while he's doing this. And uh, But the point is really the communication. Nobody's actually eating Kanzi's food. Um, she In the video, you'll see uh, that uh, she tells Kanzi to, you know, chop the onions, put some uh, boil the water. Uh, and he seems perfectly happy to go along with the instructions. And you can see here, even in this picture, uh, he's dumping some chopped onions into a pot. Uh, she's standing there turning the hot plate on. Uh, and he's got his eyes uh, directly at her face. So he knows where to get the information. So he's quite happy to follow this. But this is the kind of thing you could also imagine somebody uh, telling their dog to bring uh, treats to them, right? So go pick up the stick or the, that kind of thing. So this isn't necessarily language use. This just suggests that Kanzi can follow instructions. Uh, Kanzi also has uh, the ability to identify lots of different objects by uh, language use, uh, so a receptive language. In this receptive language experiment, one of the things they show is that Kanzi's got headphones on, which means that only Kanzi can hear what the experimenter is saying. Uh, so they'll ask Kanzi to pick up a picture uh, or to point to an object uh, through the headphones, uh, and he's perfectly able to do that. Uh, so it's not just that uh, these nonverbal cues, like picking up, you know, maybe gesturing towards the onions to chop them in the previous example, 
uh, Kanzi can isolate human language use uh, and carry out a series of steps. And as you'll see in that example, or if you've already watched it, uh, you'll see the example. These can be a series of uh, sentences. Uh, the final example, uh, Sue will sit on the uh, floor with Kanzi with a lot of objects sort of randomly assorted. And in some cases, she'll shield her face uh, by putting on a what looks like a welder's mask. So she can see out, but he can't see anything about her gaze. Uh, and she comes up with novel sentences. Uh, so you can see on this picture, there's a deflated ball. Uh, there's a rubber snake. Uh, looks like some Vaseline, a refrigerator. Uh, and she'll ask him to uh, combine things in unusual ways. Uh, so to follow a set of instructions, to comprehend sentences. Uh, so one of the things you won't see, though, uh, but uh, Dr. Savage Rumbaugh will comment on, uh, is that Kanzi can't speak, right? So because of the way the chimpanzee vocal tract is designed, uh, it doesn't allow them to make consonants. They can't really, they can make a lot of vowels. They can make a lot of uh, different kinds of sounds with their uh, vocal apparatus, but they can't make consonants, which means they can't stop where one sound, they can't mark where one sound stops and another one begins. So they can't form words the way that we can. Uh, they can listen to them and they can hear them, but they can't form them. Uh, the only way Kanzi can communicate is by using the uh, touchpad lexigram, which you can see sort of uh, right to Kanzi's left. So if he wants to communicate to Sue, he's got to press the buttons and she's got to be listening. Uh, but he can form sentences as well. So he can generate language through this sort of mechanical electronic means, but can't do it on his own. Savage Rambas seems to suggest that that's a real limitation between uh, the chimpanzee, the bonobos, and uh, humans. Uh, because they don't have the ability to make consonants, they never learned uh, how to use language to direct behavior. So they have other ways to direct behavior. So I want to move on, uh, but I want you to think about these two examples, because in the next two slides, I'm going to run through what I call, uh, or what are referred to as design features for language. Uh, and what they are, are a list of uh, characteristics of human language, uh, and what makes it kind of unique from non-human communication. So Think about the bees, which have a very sophisticated way to tell other bees where the uh, source of nectar is, uh, but that's all they can do. Uh, or think about Kanzi, who has the ability to uh, understand sentences and to generate sentences, uh, but only under these uh, very specific uh, situations. It doesn't come naturally to Kanzi to use a lexigram. Somebody else had to make that lexigram for him. So the next two slides, and these are the last two slides in this lecture, uh, I refer to these as 13 design features, and these are discussed in the textbook as well. Uh, this is from Charles Hockett, who was a linguist in the 1960s, uh, and these have become a really important part of the psychology of language. Uh, these are uh, Hockett's descriptions of what makes something a language and what distinguishes it from other kinds of communication. Let's go through these uh, one by one. Uh, and these are the kinds of things, by the way, I will probably ask on a quiz or an exam. I might give you uh, one of the uh, terms and ask you to define it or vice versa. So first of all, uh, Hockett suggests that uh, language is something that takes place in the vocal and auditory channel. Uh, and what he means by that is that communication involves the transfer between vocal and auditory uh, apparatus. There's other ways to communicate, but human language uh, and language in general seems to be something that requires uh, vocal and auditory apparatus. Now, people communicate with American Sign Language, ASL, uh, if they uh, are hearing impaired. Uh, people can also communicate if they are uh, lacking in vocal, uh, you know, lacking in the ability to vocalize. Uh, but they're using parts of the brain which are specialized uh, to control vocal and auditory apparatus. So even if you uh, lose access to hearing, you're still using areas of the brain that are designed uh, to process that information when you're communicating through other means. Another thing that's uh, kind of unique to language is that there's a, it's suggested that there's broadcast transmission but directional reception. And what that means is that when uh, someone speaks, so when I'm speaking, I send it out all over the place. So in a lecture hall, I, you know, I might be standing in the front and I'll talk. 
uh, I'll be discussing this, and my voice goes out to the entire uh, classroom. Uh, right now, I'm sitting in my home office uh, using, uh, you know, making narrations on a PowerPoint slide, but it's going out in all directions. So I send the signal out in many directions, but you as the perceiver are only getting it from one direction. So I broadcast it, but it's directionally received. Uh, another thing that's unique uh, is that it's really rapidly fading symbol uh, or signal. Uh, the verbal signal fades rapidly. As soon as you hear what I've said, it's gone, right? And that's, of course, one of the reasons we have a phonological loop in working memory is to maintain some of that uh, auditory signal or verbal signal so that you can unpack the information and understand and comprehend the sentence. So whether I'm speaking to you in person or you're listening over uh, headphones, as soon as you hear it, it's gone, right? There's no more sound there. You either have to process it, uh, you have to fit it into some kind of mental model, you have to activate concepts and memories, or you got to go back uh, and listen to it again. So the verbal signal fades really quickly. That means we have to have ways uh, to, to uh, process it before it disappears. Uh, interchangeability. This means that a speaker of a language can reproduce any message that they can understand. Uh, so to the extent that you can understand what someone has said, you can reproduce it yourself because you have the appropriate concepts to do so. Uh, we also have total feedback. Uh, the speaker hears everything that they say. Uh, so if I say something, I can hear what I'm saying. I've got total feedback to this, uh, to the way this works. Uh, this is a little bit different uh, from uh, the way uh, non-human species uh, interact. So the bee, for example, does not uh, see what the other bees see, right? So the bee is doing its waggle dance, uh, but it doesn't actually see it the way someone else does, whereas I can hear exactly what you're hearing. Uh, specialization, uh, the vocal apparatus in speech, is specialized for speech production. So the motor areas of the brain that operate uh, the tongue and the lips and the mouth and so on, uh, these are specialized for speech production. We can make other kinds of sounds, but a lot of uh, cortical area is set aside to uh, manipulate the tongue and the lips and the mouth and the teeth in a way that seems to suggest that it's uh, selected for uh, and evolved to uh, produce speech. So let's move on to another slide, and I've got uh, seven more design features. And that'll be it for this lecture. And in this uh, set, the, the, the second half of this slide, I've listed it all in one table in the textbook, but in this slide, uh, this is where a lot of the stuff starts to diverge from what we've seen Kanzi do and what we see the bees do. First of all, language has semantic content. Uh, this differs from the bees because what the bees are doing is uh, very direct, right? There isn't a semantic content. There's no meaning, uh, although they can get instructions from it. Uh, there isn't a meaning in the sense uh, that there's a semantic content to what that bee is doing. Uh, it's probably clear that Kanzi has some semantic content. Uh, so Kanzi knows the difference between chopping onions uh, and chopping peppers. Uh, so Kanzi would have some semantic content. Another characteristic is arbitrariness. Uh, and this is one that uh, really distinguishes uh, human language from uh, what the bees were doing and what most other non-human uh, communication uh, is involving. The signal need not refer to a physical characteristic of the referent. Now this is really different from the bees. Uh, the bee waggle dance uh, directly refers to the environment, right? The angle of, that the bee is uh, dancing on refers to the angle from the sun. Uh, the length uh, of time that the bee spends uh, dancing on that straight line, doing the waggle, uh, corresponds to how long you need to fly to get to the nectar. So that's not arbitrary. That's directly connected to what the, uh, the behavior is directly connected to the environment. For our speech, the behavior is not uh, directly connected to the environment. So our language uh, doesn't, most of what we say doesn't correspond to uh, 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 the characteristics of an object uh, in the world. So I choose the word, uh, I might choose the word coffee mug to refer to my coffee mug. I could use any other sounds to refer to a coffee mug. And indeed, we have uh, many languages that use different 
sounds to refer to objects. So there's no particular reason why we choose one word and another language chooses another word. Uh, discreteness. Uh, so language is composed of discrete, finite set of units. Uh, as we break language down into sounds, uh, those sounds start to lose uh, individual meaning. So as we get to the level of morphemes, uh, we've got bits of words that have some meaning content to them, and those can be broken down further into smaller phonemes. So speech sounds don't have meaning in and of themselves. They're discrete because we can start and stop them with uh, consonants, uh, but they're finite. Uh, there's only a limited number of sounds that the human vocal apparatus can make, but we can compose them and put them together uh, into, into a lot of different uh, combinations to say almost anything we want. Another characteristic, uh, and this is again shows sort of a differentiation between human language and non-human language, is the idea of displacement. Language can refer to things that are not immediately present. Uh, Kanzi uh, tends to uh, respond well when being asked to pick up the onions, uh, but it's a that's a different step to being able to refer to things that are not immediately present. We can use our language to think about things that happened a long time ago. Uh, to write stories about things that have never happened, uh, to make inferences and predictions about the future. So we can talk about things uh, that are not immediately present. I'm giving this lecture uh, online, uh, and I don't know when you're going to listen to it. So I assume that at some point you're going to listen to it. Uh, and uh, I'm just imagining the kinds of things uh, that you might think of. Uh, so we're talking, you know, I'm talking to you, and you're not immediately present. Uh, language makes it easy for us to do that because uh, we have the ability to use it to manipulate our memories. Uh, productivity, the finite set of units, so that finite set of sounds that humans can make is capable of producing an infinite set of ideas. Uh, the last two, I'll go through these quickly, trans traditional transmission. Uh, this is one in which uh, the way in which languages uh, developed across different cultures is usually some kind of traditional teaching, learning, or observation. Uh, so we tend to get our language from observing others and from teaching it to others. Uh, last one, uh, duality of patterning. A small number of meaningless units, these are those speech phonemes, can be combined to produce meaning. Okay, so that's the end of this, uh, of this lecture. I've got uh, two additional lectures to talk about language and thinking. But this first one is real really all about what language is. Uh, so as you're preparing for uh, a quiz coming up in a few weeks, and as you're preparing for the midterm exam coming up uh, in a few more weeks, uh, think about these uh, design features. I'm certainly going to ask about them. Uh, if I ask you what productivity is, uh, you should be able to define it. I may also give you a definition uh, and ask you to come up with the term. Uh, I may ask you or give you an example of something and ask you which one of these uh, is best represented by that example. Uh, so because I've listed them all here, uh, this is sort of a heuristic you might use in general, if I list a lot of things, um, like five different features or 13 different features, or here are three different things, those are really good things that I can ask about uh, on, a, uh, on a quiz or a midterm. They just lend themselves well to being uh, exam questions. Okay, so if you haven't watched the uh, video on Kanzi, please do that. If you have, uh, there's a lot of other good stuff on, on YouTube related uh, to some of these ideas. Uh, and once you're finished with those, uh, make sure you have time to watch uh, the next two uh, lectures in this unit.